Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Romania, a country which in the 12 years since it joined NATO has proven itself to be an extremely steadfast and effective member of the alliance. And I want to thank your country for everything it does to support transatlantic security and NATO's longstanding goal of a Europe whole free and at peace. Romania's involvement in NATO operations in Afghanistan and Kosovo, its hosting of key elements of NATO's missile defense capability, its commitment to meet NATO's defense spending targets, its influence as an advocate of greater cooperation between NATO and the European Union, these are all important contributions to the Alliance's overall strength and effectiveness. So thank you. Thank you all. Keeping the Alliance strong and effective uh, is as important today as it has ever been. For almost seven decades, NATO has preserved the peace in Europe, the longest sustained period in its history, and we've extended NATO's values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law across Central and Eastern Europe and beyond. Despite all that the Alliance has achieved, however, there's a lot more to do. The challenges we face today are of such complexity and breadth that we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. Of most concern are the destabilizing actions of a more aggressive and unpredictable Russia and the tide of instability which has swept across the Middle East and North Africa in recent years. But we're also wrestling with other complex risks and threats to our cybersecurity, to our energy supplies, and in the case of international terrorism, to the safety of the people on our streets. Naturally, NATO is doing everything that it can to understand these challenges and to respond appropriately. The Alliance takes a 360-degree approach to deterring threats, to protecting its member nations, and if necessary, to defending them. That is the thinking behind our Readiness Action Plan, a series of measures that we agreed to at our last Heads of State and Government Summit in Wales in 2014. These measures include tripling the size of NATO's response force to more than 40,000 troops, while enabling its spearhead force to be ready to deploy within days. We've also set up a series of small headquarters, including here in Romania, to support planning, training, and if needed, reinforcement. And Romania is doing its part, providing the core of a multinational division headquarters that will contribute to collective defense for the region. Now, as we develop our understanding of the evolving security environment, our responses develop with it. In February of this year, NATO defense ministers agreed that an increased capacity for rapid reinforcement is essential, but it's not enough. They concluded that we also need to enhance our forward presence in the eastern part of the alliance. At the same time, the United States announced plans to quadruple the money that it spends on Europe's defense as part of its European Reassurance Initiative to $3.4 billion next year, and to, to increase its rotational presence of troops in Europe. And Romania and other Eastern European allies are looking at how they can make a stronger contribution to their own security and to NATO's collective defense. Now, as recently as 2013, these were not measures we expected to have to take. In the years following the Cold War, our relations with Russia became increasingly constructive. We shared a common interest in forging an integrated, rules-based European security architecture, grounded in military restraint and respect for the sovereignty of all independent nations including those that emerged from the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. And we succeeded in cooperating on shared concerns, such as stabilizing the Western Balkans and Afghanistan, fighting piracy, and countering terrorism. NATO's ambitions for, for a mutually beneficial partnership evaporated the moment Russia launched its aggression against Ukraine, illegally annexing Crimea, and organizing a separatist insurgency in the Donbas region of eastern Ukraine. By its actions, the Kremlin has torn up the international rule book and gravely undermined the European security order that it first helped to create, including through the Helsinki Final Act, and, uh, and uh, as well as numerous post-Cold War agreements, such as the Charter of Paris and the NATO-Russia Founding Act. Thank you. 
together there. <laughs> Russia has engaged in a series of destabilizing actions using propaganda, subversion, and cyber attacks, both to undermine the security and stability of Ukraine and to test the readiness and resolve of the NATO alliance. It continues to assemble so-called anti-access and area denial capabilities close to our borders. And by this I mean anti-ship and anti-aircraft weapons that could hinder the Alliance's ability to reinforce Eastern allies uh, in, a, in an emergency. That includes, of course, the ongoing militarization of occupied Crimea and a buildup of other capabilities in and around the Black Sea which Romania has rightly highlighted as an area of key concern for the alliance. Now, NATO is responding in a number of ways. We are intensifying our maritime patrols, exploring the need for increased military training and exercises, providing support to partners like Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova, and encouraging efforts to strengthen energy security. And in this regard, Rom Romania's efforts to build a gas pipeline to Moldova, for example, will be cr critical in reducing that country's energy dependence on uh, Russia. But disturbingly, Russia has also amplified its nuclear rhetoric and posture and withdrawn from or ignored many of its obligations under existing arms control and transparency agreements. And it's done all this while falsely portraying NATO as seeking to weaken and encircle Russia and claiming that Russia's provocative military activities are a response to NATO's actions. Now, NATO's message is very clear and consistent. We are a defensive alliance, and we do not seek confrontation with Russia. A new Cold War is in no one's interests. But we cannot simply ignore Russia's actions. To do so would not only betray our own principles and encourage Moscow to risk further aggression against its neighbors, it would also be an inherently unstable basis for our future relations with Russia and other Eastern neighbors. Citizens in countries like Ukraine and Georgia will never accept the idea that they should permanently be consigned to what Russian leaders have described as Russia's sphere of privileged interests. In the 21st century, security cannot be based on spheres of influence in which the great powers dictate the choices of their neighbors and change borders by force. Now, the best response to Russia's behavior, I believe, is to take a two-track approach, one that combines strength with dialogue. First of all, we must and we will bolster our defense and deterrence so that Russia or any other potential adversary would not even think of launching aggression against a NATO member. At the same time, we will continue to engage in dialogue with Russia with a view to commu communicating our resolve restoring military transparency, and thereby reducing the risk of conflict. And we did just that when the NATO-Russia Council met last week with uh, the Russian ambassador. But one thing should be crystal clear. Uh, until Russia comes back into compliance with international law, until it ends its aggression against Ukraine, and until it fully abides by its obligation under the Minsk Accords, we cannot return to any kind of business as usual. Now, looking forward, uh, as an alliance, in order to bolster our deterrence, we'll need to go beyond the measures we agreed at our summit in Wales two years ago. And in particular, at our next summit in Warsaw this July, uh, NATO leaders will agree on the scale, scope, and composition of the enhanced forward presence along the eastern flank of the alliance that I mentioned earlier, and in particular, enhanced forward presence in those countries most exposed to a direct military threat. That presence will be rotational, multinational, and uh, combat capable. It will thereby send a clear message to any potential aggressor that if they violate NATO's territory, they will face a strong response from the whole alliance, Americans, Europeans, and home defense forces, and that they'll pay a disproportionately high price for their actions as well. Now, here in the Black Sea region, allies need to consider a more persistent multinational NATO presence with a particular focus on our maritime capabilities. Such a presence 
could be very robust but defensive in posture and consistent with the Montreux Convention. It could be based on enhanced cooperation among the regional states, Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey, uh, in the air, land, and maritime domains, reinforced by other allies and by the long-standing presence of U.S. forces in the region. Now, our summit will also have to ensure that our nuclear deterrent is credible and fit for purpose, uh, especially in the face of the increasingly irresponsible nuclear rhetoric by Russia in recent years. It's important to remember, however, that nuclear weapons will only be a last resort for NATO. Indeed, the circumstances in which any use of nuclear weapons might have to be contemplated are extremely remote. But no one should think that nuclear weapons can be used as part of a conventional conflict. Their use would change the nature of any conflict fundamentally and irre irrevocably. Now, in Warsaw, we will also take important decisions to address the situation along our southern borders. Even as we confront the Russian challenge and bolster our deterrence, we face equally daunting security threats from an increasingly unstable Middle East and North Africa, a region where terrorist groups like ISIL have proliferated, where fragile states risk becoming failed states, and where we have witnessed a huge exodus of millions of refugees and migrants. Here, too, NATO cannot simply sit back and hope that these things resolve themselves. While the alliance itself is not involved directly in the U.S.-led global coalition to counter ISIL, all 28 allies are part of the coalition, and NATO contributes in other ways to increase stability and security in our southern neighborhood. We're already working closely with several partners in the region to help them bolster their own security. Uh, we're running defense capacity building projects with Iraq and with Jordan, <coughs> training Iraqi officers, for example, in tackling uh, improvised explosive devices. We're helping Tunisia improve its special operations forces. And we stand ready to assist Libya in building its defense institutions if, if that's requested by the new unity government. But in my view, NATO can do much more to project stability in North Africa and the Middle East, much more than we're doing now. I believe we should see closer cooperation with regional organizations such as the Arab League, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and the African Union. And I hope that other means of boosting our defense capacity building programs, training, advising, assisting, will get the attention and the extra resources that they deserve in Warsaw. I also believe that we should be taking our cooperation uh, with the European Union to a new level, including in projecting stability uh, in our common uh, neighborhood, both east and south. And here I wish to applaud the efforts of uh, the Romanian government in both advocating and facilitating that cooperation. Our efforts are all the stronger when we work hand in hand and side by side with the EU. And there's much to be gained from NATO and the EU working together in issues uh, such as hybrid warfare, cyber defense, and civil preparedness. Now, the final issue I want to address is an important one, defense spending. If the alliance is to secure its own territory while also projecting stability in its neighborhood, we need far greater investment in defense. That's why at Wales two years ago, all allies committed themselves to halting the cuts in their defense budgets and gradually increasing their spending towards 2% of GDP uh, within a decade. Romania, I'm pleased to say, is one of the 16 European allies that spent more in 2015 than, than they did the year before. And I warmly welcome the agreement between all the parliamentary parties uh, to hit the 2% target by 2017. And I congratulate the government on its intention to spend more than a quarter of its defense budget on major equipment this year, which is a greater share, actually, than NATO recommends. NATO recommends 20% uh, of defense budgets going to uh, modernization. Now, our recent assessments show that it will not always be easy to live up to these expectations, even for a serious defense-minded country like Romania. 
So I urge you to continue that overall upward trend, ensuring at the same time that the capabilities in which you do invest are effective, appropriate for the, threat, for the threats we face, and suitably interoperable, meaning that your military is able to work seamlessly with other NATO allies against common threats. So along with spending more money on defense, it's essential that all allies ensure the highest levels of interoperability. Now before I finish, let me also commend Romania once again for agreeing to host an Aegis Ashore missile defense site in uh, Devicella. NATO remains committed to defending its members against any kind of threat. And contrary to Moscow's claims, our ballistic missile defense system is entirely defensive in nature and it's optimized to, defense, to defend against ballistic missile threats from the Middle East. The missile defense site at Devicello, in terms of its capabilities and its location, has absolutely no capacity to undermine Russia's strategic deterrent. This is a question of geography and physics, which Russia's rocket scientists understand full well, despite the propaganda that is constantly repeated by Russia's, uh, Russian officials. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a little over 10 weeks, uh, NATO's leaders will gather in Warsaw to discuss the many challenges that we face. Uh, the de decisions that we take there will be crucial to the continuing security of all of our nations and to our wider neighborhood. I'm confident that together we'll prove ourselves more than capable of delivering a strong response to the many challenges we face and that NATO has the resolve and the capabilities to face down aggression from wherever it may come and to project stability well beyond our own borders. So thank you very much for listening this afternoon. I very much look forward to answering some of your questions. Thank you.